thank Sophie and Andy for um, letting me present here today. Hopefully I won't put you all back to sleep with um, a presentation on blood provenancing. Um, I'll try and make it as interesting as possible for you guys. Um, so this is uh, a presentation, a little bit of um, the research that I started last year um, and mainly kind of some of the things that I've sort of come and faced a little bit of a wall with um, in this field because it's um, not particularly simple and again as Sophie was saying I've come from a purely archaeological background so there's been a lot I've had to learn and a lot of things I went into asking oh I'll do this and this and this and you know gradually I've had to sort of streamline the research and add more um, sort of scientific controls onto it. So um, I'm not going to dramatically go into provenancing theory because we'd be here for hours and you'd probably leave. Um, but basically, to put it really simply, we're defining you know, geographic and stratigraphic areas of similar flint and linking artifacts back to those areas. It's putting it really simply and really plainly, and it's not always um, something that can be done. Um, people have looked at this from a macroscopic perspective, looking at the colour um, and things like the cortex um, of the flint looked at it chemically and looked at it from a structural perspective. Um, different techniques have differing degrees of success um, and it depends how you look at different publications, how you assess that level of success. And what I found really in speaking to experts and the people that I've needed to help me to get this far is that it really does combine archaeology, archaeometry and a lot of geology, uh, things like chalk stratigraphy. Um, I've had help from a vast amount of people in different um, disciplines relating to archaeology. So there's a lot of current research, um, sorry I should mention I'm going to be talking to you mainly about geochemical provenancing because this is what I have been researching. You know, there are a lot of publications out there um, using different technologies, um, targeting different time periods, different artefacts and asking very different archaeological questions. Um, they encompass a really wide geographic scope and are published in really high profile journals. And you have to sort of ask yourself when you get to this point, you know, why are people still really querying this? Why is it still quite a controversial subject and a difficult thing to address quite often? And I think that one of the main reasons for this um, is we do have this dichotomy between the archaeological questions that we're asking, really human behaviour questions. We're asking, you know, where did this come from? How was the landscape used? How we reconstruct subsistence behaviour and what this can tell us about prehistoric populations? Things that we find difficult with the sort of dearth of um, artefacts and preservation that we sometimes encounter. Um, for example, at the sites on Jersey that we work, we really have very little apart from flint remaining. So, you know, flint remains this incredibly untapped analytical resource for us. And then when you address these really quite, you know, sometimes dynamic questions from an archaeometric perspective, you really have to look at things like the validity of the analysis, how precision and accuracy works, and what kind of sampling strategy that you've used with both geological samples and archaeological samples. So it's about getting that balance between these big ideas and something that will actually fundamentally work, which sounds simple, but... <laughs> so one of the main key reasons I think that um, this is still really controversial is that Flint as an analytical subject is really complicated. Um, this is, you know, to one degree associated with how it forms. Um, chemical variation in Flint directly depends on aspects of the formation environment of the Flint itself. Um, precipitating minerals from aqueous solution, um, you know, proximate sediment and rock. Um, um, and you know, all these things contribute to, to the, the trace elements, the major elements and the rare earth elements you find in Flint. However, you have this really, you know, this thing that makes Flint so useful to us and the fact that it was used in prehistory is, is, you know, the silica. But actually, from a geochemical perspective, the silica makes it really complicated because it sort of acts as a as a dilutant of these elements that relate to the natural environment. So what we find is that we're sort of left with this, you know, this really tiny, tiny amount of stuff we're interested in and this huge swathe of silica. <clears throat> this results in some analytical issues. Um, you know, silica often, well, more often greater than 95% in different types of flint and chert, sometimes greater than 99%. And, you know, you have really uh, a lot of difficulty analysing these lower concentrations of remaining elements, meaning that the techniques that you use have to work a lot harder um, than they would for analysing something which had a more um, representative um, suite of elements. Um, 
Equally, when you compare it with things like obsidian, um, flint is really highly uh, varied with the distribution of the elements. So when you're analysing it, you have to make sure that you know you're getting a representative sample. As flint forms slowly and often multiple during multiple formation cycles over really large geographic areas, you do get this really, um, really varied signal within the flint itself. Um, one thing that I've found in the institution I work in is that devices aren't often optimised for flint, so you need to look at developing a calibration to teach the device to analyse the flint more accurately. Um, and there's quite a distinct lack of certified reference materials, which is something that you, you, know, you buy it, people are really um, sure of exactly what's in this reference material, analyse it with your device, check what range you get, compare them and see how accurately your device is performing. Mostly it's good to do this with, you know, 8 plus if you can, but you know, we have uh, one which is a Japanese geological survey um, standard. A lot of people use um, multi-component glass samples, which are again highly silica rich with trace elements present. So, <coughs> so what I started with, um, I started with um, Mini, well, a uh, portable XRF, which has obviously its own reputation. I'm not going to go massively into detail about it. The reason we started with it, we were coming from a really archaeological standpoint, had really not any experience in science at all. Um, completely non-destructive, I could use it, it was great, I could generate results, woo, happy. Um, and this is one of the reasons why it gets criticised as a technique, definitely, because, you know, I was in there, you know, making these results relatively operationally simple and you know, that promotes a lot of criticism um, about it being used. Uh, however, obviously, you know, as you learn more about the technique, uh, it's a miniaturised device, um, which means that you have really compromised accuracy anyway. You're performing it outside of a vacuum, so you're losing information. And with quantities of elements you're looking for, less than you know, 500 parts per million in a sample, it really does struggle with accuracy. and you know. You have to be hyper aware of the resolution that you're getting with the PXRF. Possibly you're getting wide scale um, changes between northern and southern province flint. But really, when it comes down to looking at artifacts, um, <coughs> it is quite a struggle using it. Um, so, you know, qualitative data, um, you know, maybe we're providing a within study comparison is what we went for when we started using this technique. So, moving on uh, to the, well, the next stages of my project. Um, ICPMS, so inductively coupled mass spectrometry and laser ablation, inductively coupled mass spectrometry. From touring the conference circle, looking at flint provenancing, they're incredibly gold standard techniques. They're being used by a lot of people, and you tend to get less awkward questions at the end of your presentation if you've used these. Uh, so, you know, that's <laughs> mainly what I'm <laughs> moving on to. Um, so, solution ICPMS, um, you homogenize the sample, so you kind of um, you go over the issues of the variation because you've got it all in one sample. Um, so a complete elemental profile, but you know it's incredibly destructive. So um, it is trickier to get archaeological samples, obviously, um, but good for geological samples. Um, and LAICPMS, it's a very small sample, but then again, you, you start having problems with the, the variability within Flint again. So most people take uh, quite a few samples over, over the same artifact. Um, so these are sort of two, two techniques, um, but again, we come back in another circle. Um, flint isn't chemically stable, and obviously, you know, in preaching to the choir, everybody knows that taphonomic processes will alter the surface structure of flint. Um, you know, aspects of the surrounding soil matrix, for example, you know, really alkaline soils, thick chalky patina, um, percolating groundwater, adding iron to the surface. So, you know, you've got all these processes which are adding and taking away chemical uh, variation, which will, again, obviously uh, complicate the analysis. Um, and not all artefacts have suitable surfaces, which is something that I really encountered in the work I did last summer in Jersey, because, you know, when you're conserving flint, as is the case on Jersey, you work it down to the tiniest, tiniest piece. And, and as through doing that, you often these artifacts have really, um, really kind of high dorsal surface topography, um, and they've been marked on the other side. So you're sort of looking for an area where you can complete um, the analysis. These are some artifacts I've been working on the site in the southern England recently, and um, I don't know if you can see the lights a bit, but. Um, 
you know, you can see the artifact that's been split. Uh, you have the really thick chalky cortex, and then you have the flint on the inner surface. And the only reason why I was able to analyse that flint was because the artifact had been at some point in its um, museum lifespan, or possibly prior to that, had been split in two. Um, and you know, this is obviously from, from the South Downs, very chalky area. Um, and the image of this act, which is really differentially patinated. So you know, selecting an area on the artifact that you think is the truest to the original flint <laughs> could be um, a little difficult. Right, I'll speed up slightly. Um, and you know, something I'm quite interesting as well is the archaeological clouding factors of flint provenancing. You know, we're looking at human behavior. I mean, it's too simplistic for us to think you know, people were actually constructed. I visit this place, get this flint. Uh, you know, things like embedded procurement, and, and it's an assumption that specific deposits are being targeted. Um, so all about understanding and defining these outcrops within the geological and archeological zones, not simply from a pure science perspective, you know, what the landscape looked like in the past, um, what's been used up, what's no longer visible. Having a source that you don't know about can often like, severely affect statistical analysis. So um, that does make it more difficult. So I'll briefly discuss what I did in Jersey this summer. Um, so one of the main things that we want to understand is where the flint found at large sites on Jersey comes from. How familiar people are with Jersey, um, but there's no onshore flint. Um, all the flint is offshore in beach deposits, bedrock deposits. And what we wanted to see was raw material similarities within the archaeological layers. And you know, can we test these geochemically? Will they relate with each other? This is early work we did, and this again is possibly what I want to highlight: is this from an archaeologist's perspective? We're like, cool, we could do this. We could see geochem similarities in the, uh, you know, and then then you speak to someone from my second supervisor is an archaeological scientist. Not that we all aren't archaeological scientists, but you know, he's saying, well, where are your sources? You need to test you. Quite complicated. Um, so briefly, just some nice pictures, because hopefully it's not been too boring. But the channel context, and this is the site of Cote de Saint-Brelard, where we do a lot of our work. Um, and the artifacts I analysed are from this site, um, from uh, layer 5. We have quite a distinct control on the different layers in the site and what type of sea level they relate to and their time period. So uh, it's an um, archaeological layer where um, sea level would have been low enough to expose the northern coast line of Jersey, um, well, the northern submerged coastline, um, with discrete points of flint uh, eroding from sources and flint beaches. So, you know, where do our lovely artifacts come from? They all look quite different. Is this a reflection of where they've been? Um, can we see this? We've got the Cretaceous <coughs> deposits. We've got grab samples. We know there's a lot of flint offshore. <clears throat> so I studied 120 artifacts from this layer. Um, and in a nutshell, the PXRF, which is possibly due to the efficiency of the PXRF analysis, is that it was not able to, celebrate, uh, to separate flint and chert, or different colours, or bedrock versus beach flint. Um, so, you know, there are some relationships um, within the, well, here you can have a look if you like, it's not very nice. Um, <laughs> this is, obviously, I need to work out how to make this look better. Um, but I don't know if you can read it, it's very small, but you've got bedrock, beach, indeterminate, very chaotically distributed throughout those relationships. I'm not a statistician, so all I think is that it doesn't look great right now. Um, so I, you know, I will be going through that with my supervisor and um, you know, trying to make any kind of sense in it. Um, and so what next? Um, we need a tighter control study in an area with accessible flint deposits. Um, really working towards understanding how flint varies within a stratigraphic and a lateral framework. Um, doing comparative work using different techniques to assess further the variability in the geological deposits. Um, and this use of analytical controls, which obviously, as I've mentioned, is something that was quite new to me. It's gradually becoming more of what I do, which is okay. I'm thinking about the end archaeological results. Um, you know, and having a discursive atmosphere, it's probably slightly preemptive because I haven't had any questions yet, but I often find that um, presenting this kind of research, you do get it is quite a difficult environment. I've been to conferences where, you know, people that have different budgets that can perform different levels, different um, prices of analysis, and it really can get quite um, critical. When I think that with it being such a 
are difficult and unproven and you know there's no clear methodology yet published or anything so it's good to have a more explorative atmosphere to be able to talk about things more to share the research without having such a um, judgmental framework possibly I don't know I know that I found it quite difficult it's getting better for me now I'm not using the PXRF <laughs> but yeah I am um, I hope that was at least interesting we can move on to star car and things next <laughs> um, so thank you very much